this uh, June, Cor and I will uh, be married for 16 years. Uh, we are not setting records just yet, but we aren't newlyweds, and we've been through a lot of life together. In fact, we've known each other uh, for more than half of our life, and we got married young. I was I was 21, and she was 19, and certainly people warned us that that was a mistake, and uh, certainly people cautioned us that there would be difficult days ahead, but um, I wouldn't trade it for anything in this world, and we've, we've experienced so much life together, uh, getting married young. We graduated college and uh, different apartments and buying our first house and adopting and having children, moving to different states and, and countless adventures. And so we've been through a lot, but she is my best friend. And as I began to type this message, I started to think, what has been something that has kept our marriage strong over those years? Like, what, what's something practical that we've done that's been incredibly healthy for our marriage? And I wish I, I could share it with something easy, but it's not. Um, the simple and difficult mark of our healthy marriage has been to uh, quickly apologize to each other. That's not a magic formula. Uh, that's two Christ followers laying their sin at the cross and asking for forgiveness before the Lord and each other. And to be really transparent, over 15 years of marriage, I have found myself apologizing over and over and over again for being selfish. And there are symptoms of that heart posture, but uh, I'd say that's the root of it all, selfishness. It's placing my thoughts, my actions, my desires, my schedule, my money, my passions, my ministry, my, my mind. You see, you see the pattern? It's becoming self-absorbed in life and hurting myself and those around me. So to be honest, that's, that's been a running repentance in marriage. And this isn't even the main direction of the message, but... Married couples might need to go home and repent. Husbands and wives that have been deeply selfish and it's killing the relationship. You need to go home and repent and apologize to your spouse. It could save your marriage. It could save you a counseling session with, with me while the relationship is burned to the ground. But let's be open. Um, I mean, it's really not just marriage, is it? Selfishness has a way of ruining anyone in any season of their life. That's the narrative that we walk into in 1 Samuel 14. Saul, king of Israel, has another self-absorbed, selfish moment. A moment that not only harms himself, but those around him, and even his own son. Let me show us from the word the warning signs of a selfish heart. We'll be in 1 Samuel 14. I'll start in verse 24. If you have a digital Bible, I'll read out of the ESV. Um, if you have a bulletin, all of the main passage, I think it's a lot of verses, so it's probably a separate handout, but... Uh, but before we read the passage, let's pray together. Father, I, I pray that we would be honest enough, honest enough in church to just confess that many of us, if not all of us, are deeply selfish sometimes. And as I, I, I was writing the message and studying the word, this is not just a message for other people to hear. This is a message that I need to hear. And I pray that for every person here this morning, listening to the message, that they don't listen and study the word as if it will apply to someone else. 
someone in their life that they think is being really selfish. God, that they might see the warning signs in their own heart. God, teach us through your word. Give us understanding in your word. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. It has been a minute since we've been here. It's actually been a month since we last visited 1 Samuel. And we started this series last year. This is week 19 of this study. A lot has happened since the beginning. Israel has begged for a king like the other nations. If you remember in 1 Samuel 8, uh, verse 19, it says, But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And so Samuel, he, he tried to warn them. He tried to tell them that an earthly king is not what they think he will be. He tried to save them a lot of heartache. But a selfish people made a selfish decision and chose a selfish king. So Saul is now the ruler of Israel. Just a random farm boy from the tribe of Benjamin, now the leader of a nation. And we have quickly found out that Samuel, well, he was right. Saul is not who he was cracked up to be. He might be tall and strong, but his heart is frail and weak. And so the last message that we looked at in the study was in 1 Samuel 14, and we went from verses 1 through 23, this heroic act by the son of Saul named Jonathan. And so Jonathan, in the middle of this overwhelming enemy named the Philistines, stood as a man of faith, even though his father would not. It was the faith of Jonathan that led Israel into battle. But today... Well, we do have similar characters. So you got Saul and you got Jonathan and the Philistines, the narrative changes. This morning, we'll, we'll continue to see the fall and demise of Saul as the king of Israel. And we pick it up with a hard-pressed battle and an exhausted army. So verse 24. Verse 24, it says this. And the men of Israel had been hard-pressed that day. And so Saul laid an oath on the people saying, Cursed be the man who eats food until it's evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. So none of the people had tasted food. Now when all the people came to the forest, behold, there was honey on the ground. When the people entered the forest, behold, the honey was dropping, but no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan, Jonathan had not heard his father's charge, charged the people with the oath, and so he put... He put out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to the mouth and his eyes became bright. Then one of the people said, your father strictly charged the people with an oath saying, curse be the man who eats foods this, this day. And the people were faint. And, and Jonathan said, my, my father's troubled this land. See how my eyes have become bright because I taste a little of this honey. I mean, how much better if the people had eaten freely today, the spoil of their enemies that they had found For now, the defeat among the Philistines has not been great. They struck down the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon, and the people were very faint. The people pounced on the spoil, took the sheep and the oxen and the calves and slaughtered them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood. Then they told Saul, Behold, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating the blood. And he said, You have dealt treacherously. Roll a great stone to me here. And Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, Let every man bring his ox or his sheep and slaughter them here and eat. Do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. And so every one of the people brought his ox with them that night and they slaughtered them there. And Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first altar that he built to the Lord. Verse 36. Then Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light. Let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatever seems good to you. But the priest said, let us draw near to God here. So Saul inquired of God, shall shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him that day. And Saul said, come here, all you leaders of the people, and and know and see how this sin has arisen today. For as the Lord lives who saves Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall 
surely die. For there was not a man among all the people who answered him. So he said to all of Israel, you shall be on one side, and I and Jonathan, my son, will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, do what seems good to you. Therefore Saul said, O Lord God of Israel, why have you not answered your servant this day? I mean, if this guilt is in me or in Jonathan, my son, O Lord God of, of Israel, give Urim. But if this guilt is in your people Israel, give Thummim. And Jonathan and, and Saul were taken, but the people escaped. Saul said, cast the lot between me and my son, Jonathan, and Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. And he told him, I I tasted a little honey with the, the tip of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am, I will die. And Saul said, God do so to me and more also, you shall surely die, Jonathan. The people said to Saul, shall Shall Jonathan die who worked his great salvation in Israel? I mean, far from it. As the Lord lives, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. And so the people ransomed Jonathan so that he did not die. And Saul went up from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. We need to understand something as we walk into this passage today. We need to understand that a a selfish heart is not always, if rarely, a very self-aware heart. Meaning, it's dangerous because it's sneaky. You almost never see it in the moment until it begins to degrade everything that is around you, such as the case of Saul, a man full of pride, continues to implode his life, and yet... Like he can't even uh, see it. He's not even aware that it's, it's happening around him. But we see it in the passage. And so I want to show you four warning signs of a selfish heart from the life of Saul. Four warning signs that might wake you up, might wake myself up to our own selfish heart. Point one, if you're a note taker. Your eyes create tunnel vision. Your eyes create tunnel vision. Verse 24, the men of Israel had been hard-pressed that day. Why? Well, it's mentioned back in verse 22, 1 Samuel 14, 22. It says, Likewise, when all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in the battle. These guys have been going after it for the nation of Israel and their leader. They've pushed back the enemy. They've given it all. And what does Saul do? Verse 24, he lays an oath on the people saying, Cursed be the man who eats food until it's evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. All right, so Saul wants to finish taking out the enemy of God's people. What's wrong with that? Well, God's people are exhausted. And hungry and thirsty. God's people need rest. God's people need to regroup and re-energize. And yet the selfish heart of Saul can't see it. He only sees himself and his own needs. He lays an oath on the people saying, if you grew up in church, or if you've heard this story before, you've heard it as Saul's rash vow. If you have an ESV translation, I mean, it's literally the subtitle of the text today. He lays an oath on the people not to eat until the enemy is destroyed. Specifically, he says, cursed be the man. Like Saul, a king, not even a priest, is out here laying a curse on the people, on the battlefield. But don't miss it. See what he actually says in verse 24. He says, I am avenged on my enemies. All right, wait. Um, See, I thought the Philistines were the enemies of all of God's people. Like Saul, a selfish heart has eyes that create tunnel vision, meaning you can only see you and your situation. You can't see how it's impacting others. I mean, even the people that had your back the whole time are now starving on the battlefield. 
And you can't see it. And I'll make the case this morning that, that the more this country turns from God, the more it is filled with individuals that are deeply selfish. How do I know that? We live in a culture of victimhood. Now, I'm not saying that oppression and hardship is not real. Um, there are real victims out there. And there are victims without a voice and even victims that the American church has tried to quiet. What I am saying is that we're seeing a rise in victim culture where everyone is so self-absorbed that they think bad things only happen to them and they deserve special treatment. That's not justice, that's selfishness. Saul had enemies, for sure, but so did everyone else. Saul didn't want victory for the Lord he want, and his people. Saul wanted victory for himself. So if you're listening to this message and you think, man, bad things only happen to me, suffering only happens to me, that might just be a first warning sign that you have a growing selfish heart with, with tunnel vision. But secondly, what we see in the text, point two, your actions cause others to sin. Verses 25 through 30, the men entered the forest and honey was found. And I imagine these starving men with blood sugar levels dropping, like seeing the, the sweet honey dropping in the forest, like what they would give to have a taste of that. But they heard Saul's words in the back of their mind, cursed be the man. But as a person in the party that didn't hear those words, Saul's son, Jonathan, and then Winnie the Pooh style, he dips his staff into the honeycomb and his eyes became bright. Jonathan, like your father told us specifically not to do this. Cursed be the man who eats food this day. My dad said that. Man, he's caused so much trouble in this land. And how much better for this army if they would have just been able to eat freely. Now, to be fair, I'm not sure Jonathan should have said that. I think he's right. Of course, he's right. He's also undermining his father's authority before the entire army. I'm not going to defend him on that one. But the, the textual evidence appears to show that Israel resisted the first temptation, but the second one was coming. Verse 31, they struck down the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon, and they were very faint. But this time they'd eat. The people pounced like animals on the spoil, sheep, ox, and calves. And in their furious hunger, the people ate the animals with blood. Now we got a problem. Deuteronomy 12, starting in verse 20. When the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he promised you, and you say, I will eat meat because you crave meat, you may eat whatever you desire. The place the Lord your God will choose to put his name there is too far from you. Then you may kill any of your herd or your flock, which the Lord has given you, as I have commanded you. And you may eat within your towns, whatever, whenever you desire. Just as the gazelle or the deer is eaten, so you may eat of it. The unclean and the clean alike may eat of it. Only be sure that you do not eat the, eat the blood, for the blood is the life, and you shall not eat the life with the flesh. It's with the selfish oath of Saul that drove the people to ravenous starvation. It was the selfish oath of Saul that caused the people to sin. And I, I mean, even Saul sees this sin in verses 33 through 35. It caused the people to bring the spoil to slaughter, to properly cook the animal on the great stone, and no longer sin against the Lord. It was only after the selfish decision and the sin of the people that you see Saul build the first altar to the Lord. I mean, oh, the heartache that could have been avoided if he had done that before the damage had occurred. The truth about a selfish heart is that we assume that our decisions only impact us. As if we're the only ones wounded by our own sin. 
And friends, like that's, that's just not how sin works. It is invasive to the heart and destructively contagious to others. Saul wasn't thinking about how this could hurt anyone in verse 24. He didn't see that until verse 33. So eventually, maybe not right now, but eventually, your selfish decisions, my selfish decisions, they're going to hurt your spouse or your children or your grandchildren or your co-worker or your friend or your brother and sister in Christ. Sin is not an isolated decision. It harms both vertically and horizontally. And in the worst of scenarios, it will cause others to sin, to sin out of gossip, sin out of following your example, to sin out of just desperation. I mean, we shouldn't be so selfish to assume that our sin only impacts us. Thirdly, Your thoughts crave affirmation. I think Saul, um, he's trying to find his way out of this one. I'm like just trying to make a wrong right. He declares in verse 36, Let, let's go down tonight and, and we'll wipe out every single Philistine. And the men affirm Saul's desire, do whatever seems good to you. But listen to what the priest says. Let us draw near to God here. And Saul's response? Thank you. Thank you, priest. I needed to hear words of wisdom. Let's draw, like you said, let's, let's stay here. We'll draw near to the Lord. No, that wasn't the answer he was looking for. Maybe he'll just go straight to the source himself. He'll pray himself. So he does in verse 37, but even the Lord did not answer him. Can I, can I press a little here? Because I, I mean, I'm going to. Um, do you know how many people come to me for advice? Listen to that advice and then go do whatever they want. And I do get it. I mean, I, I don't always follow my advice. Um, but the church is full of people that have ignored the word of the Lord. And they're looking for an excuse to do whatever they want. Selfish hearts want an excuse, not the truth of the word. They crave affirmation for their own actions. And they will ask anyone, and they'll ask everyone until they get it. I mean, even superficial prayers to the Lord. The thing is, people that don't love you, people that really don't love you, will tell you what you want to hear. But people that really do love you, will, they're going to tell you the truth. And a selfish heart craves affirmation for their sin, but a humble heart craves wisdom from the Lord. The warning sign of a selfish heart is a man or woman that's going from person to person, or I'll go there, from church to church, trying to find affirmation to continue to live in their own sin. And Saul's not really getting that. The priest has spoken, the Lord is silent. And so Saul, he just assumes someone in the camp is guilty. Someone in the camp has done something wrong. That's why the Lord's not listening. He accuses Jonathan. There's not a snitch to be found in Israel. The men are quiet. And so in verses 40 through 42, a new route is taken. So Saul, he splits up the camp. All the men are on one side, and then him and his son are on the other. The first test is using what is called the Urim and the Thummim. We aren't entirely sure what these objects are. Uh, They could be stones that indicate yes or no. But after the first test, it was clear that the guilty party was either Saul or Jonathan. The second test, they casted lots. It's like a, a rolling of the dice, picking of a short straw. And I'm not saying that's a great way for us to make decisions today. 
Uh, I'm just saying that's, that's kind of what is taking place in the text. And apparently it works because we see that it was Jonathan that was taken at the end of verse 42. Warning signs of a selfish heart. Let me give you your last one. Your decisions cost you everything. Jonathan, with boldness, confesses in verse 43. And not only confesses, he's, like, he says, here I am, I will die. Isn't that insane? I mean, after all that we know that Saul has done, John, Jonathan is willing to die for his sin. He didn't defy the word of the Lord. He unknowingly went against his father's oath and ate some honey out in the woods. He's going to die for that? I mean, that's, that's a little crazy. I mean, certainly his dad's going to say something. He does. Verse 44. God do so to me and more also. You shall surely die, Jonathan. The boiling point of a selfish heart is a willingness to sacrifice anything to get what you want. I mean, Saul would rather see his own son die than apologize for a selfish promise that he made. And as, as we see in the text, the people wouldn't allow it. Jonathan, I mean, he's the only one to have their back. They paid the ransom for Jonathan not to die. Not Saul. Not as that, the people paid the ransom. Selfish hearts will sacrifice almost anything to get what they want. They will sacrifice time with their kids. They will sacrifice to investing in their marriage. They will sacrifice integrity in the workplace. They will sacrifice their own legacy and reputation. They will sacrifice every relationship in their life to get what they want. And I promise it will eventually cost you everything. I mean, selfishly gaining the whole world and forfeiting your own soul. See, the worst part of a selfish heart is spending an entire life living for yourself and then only to realize it just wasn't worth it in the end. I've mentioned him before. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a, a German theologian preacher that stood against the Nazi regime, spent his life living for others. He spent his life preaching the gospel that would press back uh, and conquer all dark forces. And on April 19th, 1945, he was executed in prison after being arrested by the Gestapo. And before his death, he, he did write a book um, called The Cost of Discipleship. It says this. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. It is a grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life. It is, his great, it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It's costly because it condemns sin. It's grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it's costly because it costs God the life of his son. You were bought at a price. And what a cost cost God much. I mean, it cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it's the grace because God did not reckon his son to dear price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. You want to know how to kill the selfish heart? Look to the cross of Christ. In Saul's selfishness, he attempted to sacrifice his own son for personal gain. But in God's love, he sacrificed his own son to save our very souls. It's the cross, the cross of Christ that cost everything, costly grace, and in response, we lay down our selfish heart and follow the Lord. Philippians 1 verse 20 as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that will, with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. 
For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There is certainly no space in the room for selfish hearts and the gospel of costly grace. We're called to live for the Lord. That's your main point this morning. Let's pray together. Thank you.